And Lord, we're going to look to your word now. We pray that you would uh, <coughs> pour out your spirit upon us. Help us to understand this passage. Because it's another one of those ones that can be a little uneasy to talk about. But at the same time, it's beautiful because it's, it's one of the things you created. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so now that we're back on track, not the second Sunday of the uh, month, we're going to be back in the book of 1 Corinthians. So open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians and chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 1. And once you find that, then I want you to mark Ephesians chapter 5. So Ephesians is a little bit more toward the back of the Bible, and um, chapter 5 is where you want to put a mark, your bulletin or something, so you can find it later. But the last time we were in 1 Corinthians, we looked at Paul's teachings on sexual immorality. So now I want to state this. I thought it would be a good time to express a disclaimer. I do not preach to individuals. I preach to a congregation here and whoever's watching the broadcast. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is this. I don't prepare my messages directed to any individual person. I never single out a person while I'm preaching. While I'm preparing sermons, there are times I think of individuals and how certain subjects may apply to what I know about them. I think it's only human to do that when you're talking. You think, oh, you ever, you know, like you see a movie, you see this, you hear a song, you think, I know someone who would like this. I know someone this would be good for. That's what I'm talking about. But I won't alter the direction that I believe scripture, the text is going or devote a lot of time to the concerns of one individual. For one reason, one thing, that person might not show up at church that day. And all that time I put in is kind of wasted trying to focus it on one person if um, I did all that. And then they didn't show up. But my responsibility is to pastor the whole flock on Sunday mornings and not use what I believe is the valuable time that God has given us to focus. I'm not going to waste it. She's not wasted, but spend it focusing on one individual. Now, having said that, understand this. I have done my job, or I guess I could say the Holy Spirit's done his job. When any one of you asks himself, hey, is he thinking about me? Because <laughs> I know there were times when I'd sit in church and pastor would be going on. I felt like standing up going, uh, y'all can go home. He's just talking to me. You don't need to hear this. Just It's a waste, you know, and may, many other people could possibly do the same thing. But I felt that way. I think of a Louis L'Amour quote, throw a rock into a pack of dogs. The one that yelps the loudest is usually the one that got hit. <laughs> so true. But I will let you in on this. If a particular person is on my mind when I make a statement, I never look at that person when I'm making it. So if I look at you, you're safe. <laughs> As for the rest of you, <laughs> we'll see. So I call this message, do not touch. And I think we'd all agree that's something that you don't want to touch, right? <laughs> so beginning in verse one. Now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, so we'll stop there, we can get from this that the church in Corinth wrote a letter to Paul, and in that letter they asked him some questions, which makes the rest of the chapter easier for Paul to write because he's simply answering their questions. It's like what, Paul, what Peter said in one of his letters. He said, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set your heart aside for him and his word and be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you. So if, if they say, hey, what are you doing with Christianity? Then you can tell them. Then you're not holding them like this, got them by the hair, opening and jamming stuff down their throat. You're just answering a question. That's all Paul's doing. Now, as we'll see from the text, it seems that the Corinthian church, and I'll insert probably led by the men, had asked Paul about marriage and sex, and specifically about many wives and sex, or at least many sexual partners. So he says, now concerning the things of which he wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. This must have been one of the questions they asked Paul, and the right away this can sound really restrictive, right? No touching of women at all? 
and I thought about this, and I almost put it up on the slide. I almost called this message from um, the Emperor's New Groove, remember? No touchy. <laughs> if you saw that, I almost did it, but I didn't want you to think about that movie instead, and now I blew it, told you anyway. But anyway, no, touching obviously is okay. I can touch somebody. I can touch that person. I can touch him. I can touch her. But this goes much farther than that. Touch is this. Carnal intercourse with a woman or cohabitation. So that's pretty descriptive compared to the word touching. That's much more than touching. That's having sex with, that's living with someone and having sex and you're not married. So Paul is saying it is not good to have carnal intercourse with a woman or cohabitation. He's encouraging what then? Celibacy. Paul was celibate and he thought it was good if all men were too. Well, if you're married, I don't think he's rooting for that. <laughs> but single guys. So he was also a realist. Verse 2, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, see, Paul knows the heart of man and the hearts of men. And many men, and there are women too, can't control their sexual desires. Now, I believe sexual desires are God-given. Just like you get hungry, you want to eat. You get thirsty, you want to get something to drink. You get cold, you want to put on a coat. And if you're in a marital relationship and you want to get together physically, you satisfy that. It's just God-given. Which means in God's context, sex is good in his um, design. But Satan takes those desires and runs to places that no man should go. So he says... Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. Now, Paul is not commanding that every man gets married. But if they do, they must live in a married status defined biblically. And any sex that he participates in will be with his wife, his own wife, and no one else. Note this, he says his own wife, singular, as in one wife, his wife. And I'm reiterating this because in their society, they went crazy. Men were allowed many sexual partners, wives, concubines, even temple priestesses who were nothing more than prostitutes. They considered it an act of worship to their God to go and have sex with a prostitute. Well, a temple priestess, excuse me. And that's normal. That's fine. That's what they did. Women were not valued for much of anything in their society except to please a man. Well, along came Jesus Christ, and he changed the place of women forever. Well, he didn't actually change their place. He simply put them back into the place where they belong. Now, it's not putting them where they belong, like in the kitchen. Like I heard a guy say, you know why women wear white dresses at their wedding? So they'll match the refrigerator, the dishwasher, the kitchen sink, and the stove. I'm like, wow, I can't believe you said that. And none of you here can believe I just said that, right? <laughs> anyway, that's not what he means by their place. He means the rightful place, the place they are created to be. Jesus said this in, in response to the Pharisees' question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? If she burnt the toast, you could, there were, there were uh, teachers who said, all you have to do is say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, she's out. That's how quickly they could dump their wives. He said this in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. Have you not read, meaning I know you have, but you're not listening to that. <laughs> have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Amen. And he was quoting Genesis 1.27 and 2.24, and then adding more, because he's God and he can do that. Jesus was saying that when God created man, or created Adam and then Eve, and by the way, he was the one who did that creating. If you know from John chapter 1, Jesus is the one who did the creating. So when he said, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning, <coughs> he, <coughs> me, <coughs> you know, <laughs> he didn't say that. He's, the point isn't that I made them. The point is that they were created, and this is how. This is why. That's why Jesus, at that moment, it wasn't time for him to correct them. 
but I like to interject it because it's just awesome. <laughs> then he says, by the way, did, when I created them, I, was, <laughs> I don't think that would fly with them. So he didn't want to stir that up because they wouldn't listen to the rest he said. But anyway, he made them to be married to each other and exclusively. Now, it's easy to say that because then there wasn't anybody else. Adam came home from work one day, tending the garden. He was late. His wife said, Eve said, where have you been? He goes, been working. You've been with another woman. He's like, who? <laughs> there are no other women. <laughs> but I'm bumped. But what I'm getting at is this. The design of God is one man married to one woman. And the two shall become one flesh. You like that magic trick? That's just no charge. Because I wouldn't get anything for it. <laughs> but before he created Eve... This is really cool. God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, God said that, and then he had all the animals and brought them all in a parade before Adam, and Adam named every one of them. I couldn't do that. It would be one, two, three, four. Uh, you know, Larry, Bob, Jim, Sam, I don't know. But he came up with names for all of them, and it's amazing. And you know what he realized when he was all done? He's like, hmm, there's a male and there's a female. There's a male and there's a female. Here's a male. That's all there is. Do -do -do, just kind of here by myself. It's a nice place, God. The temperature's good. Plants are great. Animals look good. They all have friends. I don't have anyone, but it's okay. <laughs> Here's the point. Adam didn't notice that first. God did before Adam did, and he came up with a solution. So when you have a problem in your life, know this. God has already seen it in advance, and he has that solution. Same thing applies to Adam that does to us. But that's a side note. The man and the woman are equal partners in the kingdom of God. And just so women don't think they can have many men in their lives, Paul continues at the end of verse 2, and let each woman have her own husband. Paul is saying that the wife should also only have sex with her husband and her own husband. This completes the concept of a one-man, one-woman marriage. And in Scripture, there are no other exceptions. Single or married, a man and a woman. So verse 3, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. This is really well put by Paul. Paul's a good writer. He says that a husband must give to his wife sexually. You know, like, where did you get that from? Well, the word let, the first word there, means conjugal duty. Part of his job is to provide his wife and himself, too. I mean, I'm just be honest with you. It's a mutually pleasurable thing, but with a sexual relationship. But he also said it must be in an affectionate way to his wife. And this affection is due her. It's what he signed up for, is to provide her with affection, proper affection, affection of a man for his wife. That means that every wife in every Christian marriage is due affectionate relations, not just the pretty ones, not just when you were younger, every wife from her own husband. And if they get to the point where physical relations aren't possible, Maybe a sexual relationship isn't possible. You can still have affection one for another. And what's amazing is as you get older and older and older, I've talked with many people who are older, and they've confided in me and said, yes, we can't anymore. But, you know, our love for each other is even stronger now. And you're like, how can that be? Because it's more than just physical. <laughs> Besides, I've, you know, as I said, I've been married now for 46 years. I've been happy the whole time. My wife's been happy for six or seven of those years. So, you know, I think it's a pretty good deal. She's shaking her head. She's very sweet. <laughs> she says it's eight or nine. No. <laughs> so, there are many ways to show affection to your wife, guys. I'm going to go out on a limb here. But is there any woman here who doesn't like proper affection? I didn't think I'd see any hands up. And the other side is also true. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The husband needs proper affection too. 
And the same goes for a wife. It's not, oh, I didn't mention this. After the, what the husband signed up for. It's not you owe me, but rather I owe you proper affection. And the wife owes her husband proper affection. She doesn't say, you owe me that. No. So verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. This is a verse that many men like. <laughs> At least this part of the verse. This reminds me of a story. The wife comes to bed. She looks at the nightstand. There's a glass of water and two aspirin. She says, honey, what's this for? And he goes, well, that's for your headache. She says, I don't have a headache. And he says, good. <laughs> what this means is the wife does not control her body when it comes to her husband's needs. Now, we're, I'm not going to get into, I'm, not even, I'm just going to mention it once. There are things that are out of bounds in the sexual relationship. If it's mutually pleasurable and wonderful and loving and caring between the two, yes. Anything else, and I'm not even going to get into it from up here. I think you, I don't want to make people's minds go wild. But do you see what I'm saying? If it's beyond what we should be doing, don't. <laughs> but as far as man and wife together, Paul said the marriage bed is undefiled. So, in another part, I think it was Paul who wrote it. But at any rate, Paul goes on, and likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So it's mutual. It isn't just like, you don't have authority, you have to. You don't have authority. You have to and, and submit to me and back and forth. It's a mutual thing. It's not a forced, coerced thing. It's just there are needs that are on both sides. The husband doesn't control his own body when it comes to his wife's needs. So here's where we need to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, speaking of the husbands and their wives, and we'll start in verse 22. Okay, so... Ephesians 5, 22, wives, submit to your own husbands. There you go. That's all we're going to read. To go back. No, I'm kidding. I'm very much kidding. <laughs> we'll get into that later, what this really means. But I want you to note, men, what's the first word of that verse? You can say it out loud. No, 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 no. First word before submit. Wives. So is it written to you? Is it written to any man in this place? No. So stop with this. You have to submit to me. If you're telling your wife she has to submit to you, you're not being a very good husband, so she doesn't want to submit to you, which we'll get into. So going on. But you submit as to the Lord. Ooh, are we supposed to submit to the Lord? Yes, yes we are. But is the Lord easy to submit to? Yes. So husbands need to act in a way that it's easy for their wives to submit to them. And in verse 23, for the husband, oh, here we go, is the head of the wife. Oh, there we go. It's crashing down again. It's all on the woman. She has, he's the head. Well, you know what, guys? The wife is the neck. But anyway, so she points that head anywhere she wants it to go. <laughs> but as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. If you're looking at it that way, not that you're your wife's savior. You don't come in like, da, 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 da. But... He loves the church and nourishes it. That's how we are to be with our wives. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. They get three verses. Guys, we get one, two, three, four, five, nine. Who's the burden on, boys? It's on us. It's just factual. I'm not even mad about it. <laughs> what good would it be anyway? Or at least eight verses. So, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Why do we have to be told that? It's not natural for us to love our wives. It's not, maybe it's not natural for us to love them, but to show it. I heard a story about a guy who's uh, 70 years old. He said, yeah, I got married uh, 60 years ago, or 65, 75, so he's like 60 years ago, whatever. He said, I told my wife the day I married her that I loved her, and if I changed my mind, I'd let her know. <laughs> How did she stay with him if he didn't say, my wife needs, me to hear, needs to hear me say I love you every day, several times a day, or she's wondering what's wrong. It's not that I changed my mind. I know one time, when I was our 30th anniversary, 
we renewed our vows, and I didn't know they expired, but we did. So, <laughs> but we did that more for our friends to just be there and celebrate with us. But it gets stale if I don't tell her I love her, and she goes, "Oh, I love you too." And I'm like, "Okay, see." She responds. Women are responders. Men have to be initiators. Not in everything, not all the time, but in general. So, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Oh, that's a whole other set of love, right? Whole other amount of love. Love your wives. How did Christ love the church? What do they say? I asked Jesus how much he loved me, and he said, this much. And he died to the point of sacrificial love, to the point where we would give our lives, little poem, for our wives. <laughs> Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We're to be the spiritual head of the house. We're to encourage study, Bible study, prayer, Worship songs, drive along in the car, put some music on, sing a cappella. If you're not a singer, put the, put the song on and hum along. <laughs> but to just set the tone. I can't tell you how many times I came home from work and I would be in a good mood and it was a great evening. I'd be in a bad mood and it ruined the household. Now, my wife could come home in a bad mood. That's okay. My kids could be in a bad mood, which often was at certain ages. You know, just want to lock them in a barrel. Stop it. <laughs> but I was not allowed that luxury, at least not publicly. I could talk about it with my wife later, but you see what I'm saying? I just set the tone. It's true, and I've seen it happen. But we are to sanctify our wives, set them apart, and use the word as a tool to wash them, show them what Jesus would have them be. Let them share with you too. Trust me, my wife shares spiritual things with me, scriptural things with me all the time. And it's a great blessing. So eventually we get presented to Jesus as a glorious church. And of course, this is obviously talking about the work that he does. But we ought to love our own wives, 28, as their own bodies. Do you love your own body? I mean, I might not like the shape my body is in. I'm about 100 pounds heavier than I was when I graduated from high school. Now, high school graduation, I was too small. It's like people are like, you love football. Did you play? I could have been the water boy if I could have been strong enough to carry the bucket. You know what I'm saying? I was lean, mean, running away from danger machine. You know, that was me. It's the only thing I could do really well was run. But I love my body. I mean, I take care of it. I eat. I keep it warm. I keep it cool when it's hot. If I get tired, I get rest. We all push the limits of all of those things, but eventually we take care of ourselves. And if you take care of yourself, is it possible when you're thirsty that maybe your wife is thirsty? So you bring her a drink. She goes, how did you know I was thirsty? I said, well, it's just that's what I do. <laughs> For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. We are to nourish and cherish our wives because we nourish and cherish ourselves. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. See, just as a husband and wife are one flesh, united in love and in marriage. People have asked me, how have you been married for 46 years? And I say, well, there's one miracle. The biggest miracle in our marriage is Jesus Christ. Because right. <laughs> it says in Ecclesiastes that the threefold cord is not quickly broken, which means there are two kite strings or threads wrapped around a cable from the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> and those threads can snap easily, but that cable is never going to break. You know, I mean, obviously a cable can break, but you're getting the, the image. Compared to that, it won't break. And you keep Jesus in the middle of your marriage, and it won't break. Because if you're keeping Jesus there, then you're being more obedient to him than not. And you're focusing on him, and you're praying to him, and you're asking him for forgiveness. There are times my wife does stuff to me, not to me, my wife does things, and I get really frustrated, and I get angry. You're like, how can you be angry at that beautiful woman that just led us in worship? Oh, trust me, I can get really mad. But then I pray. 
And after I calmed down, I said, God, you know, in the long, long term, what I'm upset about is nothing. It's nothing. And then he's like, and do I need to bring up the times you've upset her? No, that's okay. I don't want to talk about those right now. Because believe me, it goes both ways. But if you're married and you're married in Jesus, you can give that stuff to him. You can give those hurts to him and say, just replace those hurts with love and forgiveness and understanding. Because he says, if you can't forgive her, let me remind you, Christopher, how many of your sins have I forgiven? Oh, wait, excuse me, Chris. I, I know I'm God and I can hear your heart, but I can't hear you say it. How many of your sins have I forgiven you? And I say, all. Then forgive and just let it go. You don't forget because forgiveness with remembrance is greater than forgiveness with forgetting. Now, I'm not saying hang on to it either. What I'm saying is there are certain things people do to you and you've genuinely forgiven them, but you still haven't forgotten that it happened. Because unless you bump your head, you're going to remember certain things. But you're your love for them is greater than what they did against you. And that's what I believe God does. He forgives our sin. Even though he knows it happened, he still forgives. And that is, that is real love. Because he's making a choice to love us, and we're making a choice to love him. And I'm making a choice to stay in love with my wife. Amen. <laughs> and she pointed at me. It's awesome. Now i got to figure out where I was. Um, oh, Ephesians. Okay, so going on. Um, and then Paul quotes exactly what I read earlier. For this reason, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and it really is. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then he says in verse 33, a very uh, revelatory verse. <laughs> it reveals a lot. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's a Dr. Um, Emerson Egrix, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He wrote a, a book called Love and Respect, and this is the verse that he based it on. And he talks about how the greatest need that a wife has from her husband is that he shows her love, not just loves her in his mind and heart. That's important but you have to show it. To me, it's insane to buy, well, not insane. It, it's strange to buy flowers for my wife that are just going to die. That cost more than a lot of tools we could buy that we could have for years. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That's right. It doesn't matter. This shows her that I love her. Showing her. And you don't have to buy flowers. You can do any number. You can do chores. Do you know, guys, that dishes wash pretty much the same if you do them as opposed to your wife. If you put them in the dishwasher, it's okay. If you participate in the folding of laundry, it's okay. If you find out things she's overwhelmed with, because a lot of women work very hard and the men don't as much. It's just life. Men work outside the home if your wife does. I can get into a lot of um, scenarios and I'm not trying to paint myself into a corner, though I'm doing a pretty good job. But... <laughs> Men need to show their wives they love them. In fact, what I did is I put in my phone a, a reminder that comes up every night at 9 o'clock. It says, tell or show Chris I love you. In case I forget. And it comes up every night. And she'll be watching TV, driving around. I'll say, honey, I love you. It doesn't matter that it's in my phone. It's still real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It just reminded me to tell her because I need to do that. It's so amazing. Men need to show their wives and to genuinely love them, but to show them. And then let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, why doesn't the wife need to be told to show that you love your husband? Because you do. You gals, you do it. If you're married, you show love with so many things you do. But there might be a husband who doesn't deserve respect. Or you think, I don't need to do that. It's a great need of men. Man, they need their wives to respect them. You know, when I do a project, I want my wife to come out. When she tells me, wow, that's amazing. That looks great. That's her showing respect to me. Because I have a skill that she doesn't have. She has many skills. I, I mean, I can play the guitar. Does it sound like when she plays it? No, we all agree. 
You know, people say, can you play an instrument? Yeah, which one? All of them. Wow, none of them well, you know, <laughs> but I can play them. <laughs> Maybe not the trumpet. You've got to get your lips just right. But anyway, or a flute. So she has skills, and I can't, I just, I am in awe watching her play. Because she's, this hand's doing one thing, you know, pressing on the strings. Because to me, I thought the piano would be easier. You just push down. Even that's hard, you know, for me. But this hand pluck, uh, pluck in the strings or strumming and this hand, and then she closes her eyes and remembers the words and sings at the same time. I'm like, and my daughter does the same thing. Actually, both daughters now. I'm just like, and yet they couldn't go in and fix the toilet like I can. And to me, that's just, that's nothing. But they can't. We all have talents that we do. So when I fix something or I build something, she goes, oh, honey, that looks so great. I love that. Thank you. I'm like, yeah, cool. She <laughs> liked it, you know? <laughs> so men don't show that their, their wives that they love them, but they show them respect most of the time, just an appreciation, you know? But, so it's the opposites, and we need to fulfill each other's needs in that area. Okay, so now back to... Um, 1 Corinthians in verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter 7. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That means after all the talk that Paul had about sexual relations within a marriage, there is a time for abstinence. Yes, a husband and wife can abstain from sex with each other for a mutually agreed amount of time. But Paul says that it should be that you give yourselves to fasting and prayer, not for any other reason, whatever they may be. And of course, there are reasonable times to abstain. She's got the flu, guys. <laughs> He's recovering from abdominal surgery. You know, there are times you need, you got a broken bone, you got a disease, you're working through chemotherapy. There, obviously, there are times when that doesn't happen. But for the most part, those would be temporary. The sexual union in a marriage must not be broken for any, let's call it any unreasonable situation. Now, why is this important? Because especially when you've been married for a while, abstention makes you desire sex more. And as Paul said, Couples who abstain must come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And the Corinthians were especially lacking self-control. But are we in America any different, any better? Probably worse. You really have to withdraw from media of any type. You have to get away from movies, from TV, from music, from magazines and advertising, or even just walking around in public to escape sexual temptation. I know a guy that said, I think I'd said this before, but he said that he'd get so frustrated at summertime because the women would wear, women would wear so little clothing and say it's because they're hot. And he'd even go, I'm too hot, just imitating their voice. And I, would, I thought to myself, that's valid. I don't think maybe that they should dress some of the ways they do, but you know what else should happen? You shouldn't be looking. It's not that you don't see people, but... It's, it's the look, and you go, oh, whoa, okay, I can't look there again. Instead of the look, and you go, whoa. And maybe you come over here where you can get a better look. No, that's not what that's saying. <laughs> a healthy sexual relationship with your spouse will help keep you under control. There are six, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Now, God has many commandments in Scripture. I can think of ten of them right off the bat. <laughs> But this is not one of them. God allows it, but he also sets a limit on it. I remember talking with a couple. I was counseling with them. My wife was with me. And um, the husband was having some um, sexual immorality issues, so he decided he and his wife needed to abstain from sex. Maybe that would help. And I said, no, I'm going to give you some homework. Go home and have sex with each other. Just no. Don't. That just makes it worse, you know, Okay. There are other problems that are leading to that. We can talk about those. We can get into that. But abstention for that, I totally disagree with that. Okay, and as far as celibate life goes, verse 7, For I wish that all men were even as I myself. Now, Paul was a single man during his ministry. We aren't told in Scripture if he was married or not. 
But many people believe Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. It's basically the Jewish Supreme Court. And in order to be a member, one must be married because they're based on the scriptures, not good that man should be alone. So they, okay. And Paul seemed to understand the needs and wants of a wife more than a man who was never married. Just makes sense. But he's most assuredly unmarried at the time of this writing, and he stayed that way for the rest of his ministry. So why did Paul think it was an advantage to be single as a Christian? Well, single people are much freer to do as God directs. If God calls you to mission field, there's only one person to convince. You. <laughs> and then, of course, you make other arrangements, boss and someone to watch your cat and stuff. But support is easier. You only have to get money for one person. Concerns about a spouse or children, they're not there. So Paul said it's just easier to be single in ministry, and, and that's any form of ministry. You don't have to go to a foreign country. You can be here and be involved in ministry. But each one of you has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. So Paul is saying that celibacy is a gift from God. And not everyone can be celibate. I heard about a young man who was given by God. He was given the gift of celibacy. And he clung to that and he stayed pure and stayed true. He used the gift very well until he met a certain woman. <laughs> and they got married. And before the honeymoon, he prayed to God and said, Thanks for that gift of celibacy, but since I'm married now, I'm giving it back. <laughs> I don't want that gift anymore. But seriously, God gives gifts to every one of his believers, but not everybody gets the same gifts. Same is true with celibacy. If you're married, you don't have that gifting. If you're single, you either do have it or need it. And if you get married, give it back. Verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. So if you aren't married, Paul says, stay that way if you can. Whether you're single by choice or single by the death of your spouse, Paul says it's good for them if they remain even as I am. Being single is a good thing if it's a God thing. I know some people, and I'm just, I'm like, I'm surprised. I say, wow, you guys are single. I've met them at other churches and stuff. And I just figure, how did that happen? And then they tell me it's just the Lord. I'm, I'm not even looking. And then the other people that are single that want to be married. And so they are looking. And I talked with one woman. She was in tears. And I said, I was talking with her. And she said, but I just want a husband so badly. I said, okay. There are two types of men you can have. There's the one who's Mr. Right. And then there's the one who's Mr. Right now. <laughs> Which do you want? She's like, well, I want Mr. Right. She said, okay. And so within six months, she found him and they got married. But it's important to realize that singleness and marriage are both gifts from God. God is the one who distributes the gifts, and that includes marriage as well as celibacy. And we should not wish for the other state if we're not there, because the grass all always greener on the other side of the fence. Sometimes it's because that gets watered more. How about watering where you live and see if it'll green up? David Guzik says, quote, while Paul recognizes that some are gifted for marriage and some are gifted for the unmarried state, no one is gifted for sexual immorality. Some people act like they're gifted on it, you know, because they're really good at it, but that's not a God thing. The married must live faithfully to their spouse and the unmarried must live celibate. Now, if celibacy is not a God thing in a person's life, verse 9, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. Self-control is a difficult thing to master because you got to control yourself. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the title. As it said on a sign at a bank teller's counter when I was a teenager, I still remember it. It says, I can resist anything but temptation. <laughs> temptations are everywhere, especially sexual temptations. It's bad enough when we put ourselves in temptation's way. But we can be tempted sexually without any planning whatsoever. Job said, um, I think it was Job, says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Oh, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully after a woman or at a woman. But I think it's, maybe it's in Proverbs, but I, set, I will set no vile thing before my eyes. It's like, why does that have to be there? Isn't that obvious? Well, yeah, it should be. But we're bombarded with images that stimulate us in whatever way. Why would we specifically, deliberately put an image or something that tempts us right in front of us? Why would we do that? 
because we like it. We know it's wrong. Anybody here think that sin is, is okay with God? I didn't think so. There was an old TV show called Candid Camera. Alan Funt is the guy who created it. I didn't realize it was on TV for like 50 years. But they would catch people doing funny things on camera when they didn't know they were being filmed, and often they had help from a lot of people setting it up. And the introduction went something like this. Don't be surprised if sometime, somewhere, someplace where you least expect it, someone steps up to you and says, smile, you're on candid camera. Well, for all of us, and all of us, sexual sin can appear out of nowhere. Temptations can. To paraphrase this camera, ca candid camera opening, don't be surprised if sometime, somewhere, someplace, when you least expect it, sexual temptation steps up to you and says, hey, check this out. It can happen. You may not be expecting it at all. You can be sitting in this service right now, and all of a sudden, something goes in your head like, whoa, where'd that come from? Well, it wasn't the Lord, and a good part of it possibly wasn't even you. It'd be the enemy. He comes into church? Yeah, because you brought him. Sorry, it's true. It's our desires. Allow him to come. We're, we haven't, have, has anyone here totally convinced and given themselves over to God 100%? We sing, I surrender all. It should be, I surrender some. I surrender a little more than the other guy next to me. <laughs> it's true. Now, we work on that, right? There should be improvement. The Bible, the Bible teaches Jesus accepts us just as we are. It does. And then he expects you to grow and be less like you were. <laughs> There's always more and more work. We always have more to do. Until the day we stand before him and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. What do we do when that happens, whether we're married or not? What do we do when sexual temptation places itself in front of us? Paul told us in 1 Corinthians of previous chapter 6, verse 18, flee sexual immorality. As they said, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, run away, <laughs> run away. <laughs> and sometimes it's that basic. Just put it in B for boogie and go, get out of there. And here's why. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. See, burning with passion is a very bad thing. This isn't regular sexual attraction that people have. No, this is a, or excuse me, this is no slight sensation. It's being so on fire with passion that you can't stand up against it. So you give in because burn means to be inflamed with sexual desire. If you're inflamed, you're going to get burned up by it. Now, you single people know this. If you struggle with sexual immorality, it may surprise you to know that getting married does not magically remove that from you. Because <laughs> you've cultivated it for years. Only God can do that. And it's better to deal with it before marriage. Marriage is tough enough without bringing in any extra baggage. And I call this message, Do Not Touch. And after talking through this, you can possibly see why I picked a porcupine. <laughs> Because for us to touch the porcupine can be dangerous, right? You ever seen those animal vet shows where a dog goes in and comes back and he looks like a pin cushion? And sometimes they have to knock him out. And they, sometimes they'll put sound effects like boing, 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 when they pull all those and they get them in their mouth. But do porcupines shoot each other? I don't think so. And did the porcupine race die off millions of years? Well, millions, sorry. A long time ago? <laughs> Or they're still porcupines. Somehow they can touch each other. They're designed for that. But I, th I think it's more true than not that the Sunday school teacher, or Sunday school kid said that Solomon had, what, 300 wives and 700 porcupines <laughs> instead of concubines, because it fits so well. No touchy. Your wife, touchy. Your husband, touchy. You're single, no touchy. And that sounds harsh in today's world, right? In America? In America, you're supposed to meet somebody. Or maybe you talk to them at a bar or a restaurant, and you have a meal, and you go home and go to bed together. It's like, isn't that natural? Isn't that what everybody does? No. But that's what the world is trying to teach us. What does God say? Save that for marriage. God says, man and a woman, nobody else, no third person, no two male, no two female, man and a woman. I don't hate homosexuals. I probably love homosexuals. Maybe more than some of them do. But homosexuality is another thing. God teaches against that. 
Because Jesus said, that's the design, was a man and a woman, and they get married, and there's no one else. And if you're not married, same thing. There's no one else. It's just you. Amen? Amen. That's what the book says. Amen? Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you for guiding us through this. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for not skipping this. Because there are times people say, I don't want to talk about that. That's uncomfortable. Well, you wrote about it, and you intended for us to read it, and you intended us for no, to know about it, and you intended us to obey it. So I pray that we would. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that there's grace for any of us who have participated in sexual immorality. There's forgiveness, there's grace, there's love, there's acceptance. And there's another word that's involved from our end, and that's repentance. That we would change our direction, walk toward you, walk in the light. And if we walk in the spirit, as Paul wrote, we will not fulfill the desires, the lusts of the flesh. So thank you for sharing this with us, God. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.